for the Canadian Society of Physician Leaders, I'm Pat Rich, and this is Leading the Way, the podcast for and about physician leaders. We've been off the air for a little while as we were focusing on organizing this year's virtual Canadian Conference on Physician Leadership, CCPL, held at the end of April. We're back now. And on today's show, your host, Dr. Johnny Van Arda, Executive Medical Director of CSPL, will be speaking with Dr. Brian Hodges. Brian is Chief Medical Officer at the University Health Network in Toronto and Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto. At this year's CCPL conference, Brian was the opening keynote speaker and addressed the need for renewed commitment to compassion in healthcare. Over to you, Johnny. Well, uh, thanks, Pat, and it's good to be back, everybody, and welcome, Brian. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to speak with you. All right. Brian, let's get uh, right into it. Uh, You co-edited a book on compassionate care and how actually there is no healthcare without compassion. So just for our listeners, can you set the scene for us and describe briefly what compassionate care means for you? I think the word compassion is widely used, but has so many meanings that we need to unpack it a bit. I would make three points about it. A commonly used term is empathy. And empathy usually used to mean a feeling similar to or the same as someone else is a very, very valuable sensation or feeling that we can uh, evoke or experience as a health professional. But empathy is just empathy. Compassion, as we've taken it up in the book, talks about action, taking action to reduce suffering. So empathy is a necessary but not sufficient step. Compassion is doing something, it's taking an action. A second concept that's important for us is that it's not defined only by the person doing it. You don't do compassion to someone else. So with a patient, for example, doctor-patient, it's defined inside the relationship. And sometimes, as patients tell us, and one of them wrote in the book, the best, most compassionate thing is doing nothing, just being present, just witnessing or listening. And the third concept that we really try to develop in the book is that although compassion is really important between two people in a doctor-patient relationship, it's also about groups, populations. We can be compassionate in taking action against suffering of many kinds. We can think about the long-term care effects of COVID. We can think about how we show compassion through actions for populations and communities as well. So recently in another book, Steve Tretziak, in doing a whole bunch of systematic reviews, found that compassionate care also affects outcomes and compliance to treatment. Uh, But there is this even more recent interesting evidence where some recent studies looked at an open label placebo effect. And and, And the studies found that even though the patients knew that they were receiving placebo, their symptoms improved. And so the researchers attributed that effect to the quality of the medical relationship. I mean, it's a little bit like in the days of Hippocrates, like the laying on of a healing hand. And so with that in mind, we also have seen the virtual healthcare visits that have skyrocketed in the last year. And so my question is, or a couple of questions, how do you think virtual care might affect the relationship component that contributes to healing? And then going a little bit deeper, can physicians actually offer compassionate care in the absence of direct to direct person interaction and the lack of the laying on of the healing hand? It's a fascinating set of questions. Let me start with the first part, which is the therapeutic effect of the relationship. This is as old as medicine itself. Doctors, since the beginning of time, health professionals know that one of the most potent effects we have is is through the relationship. The historian uh, Edward Shorter has argued, in fact, that doctors might have even been better wielding the relationship before we had any notable treatments, that sometimes the actual use of treatments might take away from our attention to harnessing and using the relationship. But that said, all of us, uh, I'm a psychiatrist, of course, but all doctors know that forming a relationship can contribute to healing. The recent evidence you're talking about that a good relationship leads to better compliance, better outcomes, even better survivals. I would say that the question is a little bit, maybe I could hone the question a bit, which is how does technology help or, or hinder our ability to use the relationship for healing. So virtual is definitely a hot topic. In my hospital, we do about a million ambulatory visits a year. And within about three weeks in wave one, 80% of it went virtual. As a psychiatrist, 
all my outpatients went from seeing me in my office face to face to being virtual. So we're we're definitely grappling with understanding the impact of that. But to understand whether it's good or bad, to make the question a little more complicated, I think we have to unpack what we mean by technology. So I would start by saying, I think of technology as something that augments a human ability. So the human voice is important, but weak. So we amplify it. Right now, we are speaking to each other through a series of technologies. Without this technology, wherever you are and wherever I am, we couldn't hear each other. And so we amplify. The same with sight. I wear glasses. I wouldn't be able to, my human eyes are too frail, or I might need a microscope to see bacteria. So at the base, virtual is just a tool. The question that's important for me is how can it be used or in what way can that technology be used to augment compassion, augment the relationship, and when does it interfere? So if we go back to my examples, if we amplify a voice through a microphone, that could really help with understanding, but it's but if it's riddled with feedback and distortion, it, it ruins the relationship. So it's the same with virtual. And, and I think what happened to us in the past two years is we were forced to onboard a technology that many of us were not. I know how to be fairly compassionate, I think, using the telephone. When I was forced to use Zoom or Teams or Skype, I'd never used that for the care of patients. And I think even now I'm unpacking with my patients and I ask them very much, I think we all need to do this, what aspects of this are helpful to you and what aspects are not? Mm -hmm. I would also point out that sometimes presence, you know, we overcomplicate sometimes. Maybe we don't need Zoom. I have had patients that are going through really tough times, uh, even including suicidal ideation, and simply sending a text message to say, are you okay? can be perceived as very compassionate and very helpful. So the, the architecture of, of Zoom, of Skype, of MS Teams, of all of this might be helpful in the way an electron microscope might help us look at something, but you don't need an electron microscope to look at a urine sample. Brian, one of the things that has started to worry me for our colleagues and for the health system in general is something that has happened, I believe, due to the pandemic or the syndemic, as some of us call it. Because on one hand, we know from some of your work and from what Stephen Tretiak found that compassion reduces burnout right and one can can show compassion i mean you don't need to spend um, an hour in order to show p p compassionate care so compassion reduces burnout on the one hand but we now also see an increasing level of compassion fatigue during the pandemic and so i have two or three questions i mean is this happening because we cannot take that last step of action like you said which is really the compassionate element, or are we subconsciously protecting her? And I wonder, I mean, how do you reconcile these two seemingly contradictory facts? I think a good starting place with the relationship of compassion and burnout would be the acknowledgement that compassion, it's a resource. It's a kind of energy. It's not a characteristic of a person, or at least if it is a characteristic of a person, it comes and goes according to the reserve that a person has. So I know that there are days when I get up in the morning and I have lots of energy and I've slept well and I physically feel well and, and I'm brimming with compassion. I can handle a very tough situation. I was reassigned to the COVID care ward. Very stressful for me to be caring for uh, COVID patients, titrating oxygenation, calling families. However, I was in a position that I had good support and I felt well and I was able to do it. But I've also had that experience many times in my career where I'm, I'm tired, I'm spent, I'm, there's other things on my mind, maybe family problems interfering, I'm depleted. So I think what you're describing is a, a product of a pandemic that's gone on for 15, 16 months without letting up. So people are, and I think the first important thing for people to do is recognize we're human. And sometimes we just can't do it anymore. And, and when that happens to, to recognize that state and and to try to take a break or, or go for a walk or get someone else to help. But I also think we, we sometimes as physicians misunderstand what we need to do. One of my colleagues, uh, she's a wonderful patient uh, partner in our hospital, said, too often, Brian, you know, I think doctors think what we mean is that you need to do a 45-minute full psychiatric history, but I don't need you to be my best friend. I don't need to know about the conflict with my mother. I might just need you to put a hand on my shoulder or look in my eyes or just say, how are you? I think too often we are so motivated to do something that the doing something could simply be just being understanding, just being present. 
of course, when we talk about compassion and compassionate care, um, the first thing that comes to mind is in caring for others. But as we go through, you know, comp compassion fatigue and, and burnout, um, I think, and you say that very nicely in your book uh, as well, is that compassion for self is a very important uh, component as well. I think the, the, the first and necessary step before we can be compassionate is we have to be okay ourselves. If we're not okay, then I believe that it's almost impossible to provide adequate compassion for another person. I was standing at the elevator the other day. I looked at a colleague who I hadn't seen for a little while, and I said, how are you? And she burst into tears. And I thought, oh, good heavens. And one of the phenomena as a chief medical officer with some responsibility for so many doctors and so many healthcare professionals is I realized a fair number of people are actually not okay. There is still a little bit of a hierarchical militaristic culture in medicine that means we're stoic and we hide that. And I would have to say, watching a number of my colleagues fall by the wayside during this, this time, that your point about being okay, about being vulnerable, asking for help, making sure that we check with each other that we are okay is, is critical. We need to support each other and show the same compassion for colleagues as we show for patients. You, uh, you also just talked about your reassignment to uh, the medical ward uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it, and it reminded me of what you said in, in the recent Canadian conference on uh, physician leadership, where you talked about leading teams to help with the long-term care in the early stages of the pandemic. And then you also talked about staffing a mobile vac vaccination clinic, you know, more recently at the beginning of this year. I mean, when you put all of that together, what have some of these experiences taught you about leadership? Yeah, I'll use two examples. One would be my redeployment to the vaccine work. For two months, I was uh, side by side with our largely family medicine team every morning and every afternoon vaccinating in long-term care. We put a major thrust on vaccinating all the long-term care institutions in Toronto. And uh, as a psychiatrist, although I had certainly in my general training done injections. It wasn't my area of expertise. What I realized was I needed to quickly identify who had the skill set. And I worked with a, a lot of gifted colleagues. One actually was a nurse, Eugenia, very talented nurse who, who spends her time immunizing babies. And I could contribute because in the long-term care homes with folks with dementia, which is partly my area of expertise, I could build a relationship where I could calm them down. But the, the act of quickly and safely, painlessly injecting was what Eugenia taught me. So in that instance, I realized that I could bring some, uh, but for all the observation that I was the chief medical officer, that was irrelevant to the purpose of empathically, compassionately vaccinating people. And a few weeks ago on GIM, uh, to my great pleasure, uh, it wouldn't be safe to assign a psychiatrist all alone on a general medicine program. <laughs> <laughs> so my boss was actually a, a young fellow called Dr. Ryan Luther. Ryan Luther was the chief medical resident just a couple of years ago. And so uh, you might guess that I'm a little bit older than that talking about <laughs> my formative years in the 80s. And yet, what a pleasure to have as my boss, a new graduate in medicine. And, and again, if I learned anything about leadership or relearned anything about leadership, it's that the hierarchy, if there is one, should be based on who has the most expertise at the time. That person should be in charge and leading. And, and the followers are the ones that have something to contribute, but in deference to the leader. And that's the essence, I believe, of distributed leadership, where you kind of shift the quote unquote power around depending on what's needed in the moment and the others uh, kind, of assist, uh, kind of assist the leader then. Absolutely. I, I think if anything comes from the pandemic, that's good. And I hope there will be some things. I have watched many situations where the typical hierarchy has been eroded or challenged. And the people I see really thriving in our environment are those that have the cognitive flexibility yeah. to adapt to that distributed. Right. And talking about that uh, experience of, of the pandemic. So here you are, the uh, UHN executive vice president for education and the chief medical officer. So what do you believe will never be the same again in the Canadian health systems and subsystems after the pandemic? And what do you think will probably never change? That's a challenging question. My memories of the HIV AIDS time were formative for me and a whole generation of doctors and nurses and others. And I don't believe we were ever the same afterwards. 
You cannot unsee things that you've seen. I don't think a lot of us will ever be able to unsee what happened in long-term care. There's lots of inquiries, investigations, and processes that I hope will help us change that. A compassionate approach would be to do something about the fact that there was so much death and suffering in long-term care. I can't unsee the patients I saw on ECMO, ECLS, in our intensive care unit who were almost all young middle-aged people from racialized communities who work in distribution warehouses and factories and whatnot. Those are just my stories. Every person I encounter has a series of stories like this. We won't be able to unsee those. But I hope what we take away is what I spoke about earlier, that we all learn to stretch, to think about leadership and hierarchy differently, to adapt really quickly to the demands of new forms of care like virtual. And I hope maybe we've taken away something that yes, resilience is important, it is. We need to bounce back, we need to be emotionally resilient, but we also need to be flexible. We need to be cognitively flexible that it's a good thing to put ourselves in challenging situations with new contingencies where we don't always know what we're doing with support, mentorship, colleagues. And I'm hoping that the healthcare system and the collaborative models of health professionals will, will be stronger coming out the other side of the COVID pandemic. Brian, we know how incredibly busy you are so on behalf of myself and the CSPL membership I I can't even begin to thank you for taking out the time out of your busy schedule to have this very deep conversation with us thank you very much it's a great pleasure to speak with you today and thank you for what you do in bringing these topics to light thank you and now back to you Pat thanks Johnny and thanks Brian that's our show for today. We hope you enjoyed this episode and are looking forward to more podcasts like the one you just heard. Please subscribe to the podcasts through your favorite podcast platform or access them via the CSPL website at physicianleaders.ca. Until next time.